Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Bruce. I am a divorce lawyer in South Florida, and today I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by Mona Nasser. Um, Mona is a psychotherapist in the West Palm Beach area that I've um, had the personal opportunity to know now for um, quite a few years. She leads a group practice um, nearby, and she's um, made the time gracefully to speak to us today about how to holistically eliminate um, anxiety and depression in divorce or other hard times, which is a topic that I think is crucially important for people going through divorce or many of those, um, you know, similar, just difficult life events. So Mona, thank you for, for joining us. And maybe before we get into the, um, the topic, just tell people, you know, briefly who you are and, and how you came to be talking about all this today. Thank you. Well, I studied at Palm Beach Atlantic University, and I got my master's in counseling psychology. I went on to found uh, a counseling center within a large organization and did that for nearly 20 years and have since opened a group practice in downtown West Palm Beach. And I have an amazing team of psychotherapists that serve Palm Beach County, serve the community in the various areas of specialty that they do. And I can certainly vouch for that. You have a, a great team over there. They're, they're very much present in a lot of um, our community events, um, both giving back to the community and um, you know, for doing very good work for it. So thank you for, thank and to you. your colleagues for all of that. Mona, before we get into, I, I guess, um, how to maybe eliminate anxiety and depression, um, and, and divorce or some of the other hard times. If, if you could just for a moment help our uh, viewers and listeners understand, I mean, what are the signs of anxiety and depression? Because I, I don't know that everybody really, really knows when those things are, are, are rearing um, their ugly heads in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Fear is, is so common in divorce because as human beings, we much prefer the known and in divorce, there's so much that's unknown and it's very fear provoking. So they may experience sleeplessness. They may experience um, various somatic symptoms like tightness in the chest or heart palpitations or the feeling that they can't breathe properly. Um, they could have sweaty palms. Uh, they could have that sense of fight or flight, um, sensing in their bodies that there's imminent danger um, all through the process of divorce. It is considered uh, something quite traumatic to be mm -hmm. going through. It's one of the hardest things in, in life to, to process through. And um, just did you see just with, you know, the clients of your practice and your colleagues, or maybe just from your knowledge of um, everything involved with this, or are there times during the typical divorce process to where somebody's more likely to, you know, experience some um, depression or anxiety? Mm -hmm. uh, we do see it quite often that the folks that come in to see us are struggling with depression and anxiety as a result of pending divorce or the possibility of divorce and what it's going to mean for themselves, both um, relationally, financially, what it's going to mean also for their children. The unknown of the future is quite anxiety provoking throughout. Um, and even uh, post-divorce, the process of developing a new normal and a new rhythm of life is uh, can be quite anxiety provoking. So Mona, uh, we've talked about what anxiety and depression are and, and, and how they are prevalent, I really through all stages of, of the divorce process and, and even after for, for a lot of people. But what are, what are the best ways from your perspective to, in a holistic manner, try to eliminate or avoid anxiety and depression during the divorce process? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I feel very passionate about helping people to be freed of what can be quite debilitating with, with anxiety. And I really look at it from a very holistic approach. Um, 
everything from getting morning sunlight, 10 to 20 minutes, into the eyes, not a hard stare to hurt yourself, but definitely direct sunlight, no sunglasses, and it can't happen through a window. Uh, bright light, first thing in the morning, helps to set circadian rhythm. And the significance of that is the quality of sleep you'll have later on in the day. Another thing that we recommend to folks that struggle with anxiety and depression is the avoidance of caffeine. Um, it is true that maybe one cup of coffee can optimize a workout um, and help with cognition or focus, but really more than that one cup would be not advised for someone struggling with anxiety and depression. Additionally, not to have caffeine past the noon hour. So if someone sleeps at 10 o'clock, we don't want to consume caffeine for 10 hours before bedtime. So if they sleep at 10 p.m. at night, they wouldn't consume caffeine past 12 noon. Additionally, exercise is one of the most underutilized antidepressants. It's incredibly useful in regulating hormones and mood and, and a sense of well-being. So exercise, at least 20 minutes each day, that we say 150 minutes in the course of the week, is an incredible deterrent and treatment for depression and anxiety. Sleep is so very important. So what we recommend is the lights in our homes should really mimic the lights outside. So at nighttime, we don't really want to flip on bright lights in the house. We want the, the lights in our home to be dim and calming, just like the sun, setting sun. And if you're able to get the setting sun's light into your eyes, that's very beneficial as well. There's the um, practice of NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. Midday, it takes only 10 minutes, and we consider it a nervous system reset. I do it myself. It's a non-negotiable every single day. Non-sleep deep rest, you can get it for free on YouTube. And it is just 10 minutes of a restful meditation. And it really resets the nervous system and is very, very calming. So NSDR is another recommendation we have for anyone that's struggling with something like divorce or really any circumstance that's causing them to feel anxious and depressed. There's also supplementation that's very useful. If uh, one of the common things that someone experiences is difficulty either falling asleep or staying asleep, if they're struggling with their sleep rhythm, there is the consideration of supplementation. We don't recommend melatonin because there are, there's lots of science out there um, um, that it does cause our brain to stop producing what it should produce on its own. So we don't want to train our brain to not produce that um, very necessary hormone that brings about restful sleep. But there are some supplementation like apigenin, which is an extract of chamomile that is recommended. Also magnesium. Magnesium is very, very powerful to bring calm, to bring restfulness, and to allow us to sleep deeply so that we can wake up feeling rested. The third supplement that is recommended to take is theanine. And theanine is the contributor in sort of that dynamic trio that brings about a restful and, and calm sleep. So those are some behavioral protocols that we recommend. They're free to do. They're relatively easy to do and to incorporate into a rhythm of life. And then there is the protocol of recognizing internal dialogue. So most of us know how we feel. We also know how we behave. So we may know that we cried or we cry easily 
or we're impatient and snap, or um, maybe we sleep too much or not enough, or eat too much or not enough. Oh, yeah, so we're okay. aware of how we feel, and we're aware of how we behave. But what actually creates both how we feel and how we behave is our internal dialogue, that internal tape playing, our self-talk. And so one thing that we teach uh, as cognitive behaviorists, as well as other modalities, but this particular one treats anxiety and depression so successfully, is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's where we teach the person to be aware of what their self-talk is. What is their internal dialogue, which is creating their emotions and their behavior, what they decide to do or don't do, the risks they'll take, or whether or not they recoil from life, whether they feel courageous, or whether they feel paralyzed by fear, all comes from internal dialogue. So CBT is a very powerful modality that happens in the therapeutic setting, in the counseling environment, and that's one of our specialties at Restoring Hope. So well, Mona, and really, that's an amazing um, answer. I think there's a, a lot to, to take away from um, what you just said. Um, one thing I, I did want to ask you to maybe supplement onto that for those of um, those of the listeners that are um, taking this all in that aren't going through the divorce themselves, but um, know somebody else who is. Maybe it's a close family member, a, a child. Um, Maybe there's some some therapists and attorneys listening to this that, that want to make sure their their client, you know, is, is supported in the best way possible. Do you have any, you know, maybe extra tips or things that that those supporting family members or professionals should just take into account to to better help um, a, a loved one or client who's going through maybe a difficult divorce and um, grappling with um, you know the feelings of anxiety and depression? Yeah, I think that one of the common things that exacerbate the situation when we're going through difficulties like divorce is the feeling of isolation, feeling alone in and through it. So I think that we can offer such great support by helping the person to know that we're there for them, that they're in safe space, that we can offer a listening ear so many people just don't feel heard. They don't feel heard and they don't feel understood. So as friends or loved ones witnessing um, those going through difficulties like divorce, we can offer empathy, help them to feel heard, offer empathy, and keep in contact with them. Reach out, whether it's in person or text, or a phone call, uh, sometimes that can make all the difference just to know that that person has you as a support through such a difficult time. Additionally, helping them to know that it does get better, that this time will pass, and it does get better. I think additionally what we can do to support our loved ones that are going through divorce or any other difficult time and struggling with anxiety and depression is to encourage them to get outside, to breathe fresh air, to ground in the earth, to be active in receiving that morning sunlight, that afternoon or evening sunlight. Exercise is so very important. Movement is so very important. And studies do show that there's a greater benefit to doing it outside if we can and also doing it in community if we can, which is another um, encouragement that we can offer uh, those folks is to not be alone in this, to create that social support that they need. Join that group. Join that gym. Go to that event. Um, really disallow the isolation to set in. Push through that, knowing that it will get better and that support can make all the difference. So Mona, I just as a follow-up to, to 
to what we were just talking about, I mean, I, I had a quest question. Maybe, maybe this is you consulting for my law practice here, but we see a lot of clients in the divorce that they end up, it's almost like they start trying to predict the future in a, in a, in a, a negative way. They, they're like going way past where we're at and kind of predicting doom and gloom. And I don't know if I'm phrasing all this right, but we see it happen with people and we really you know, appreciate any of your, your input on how we can work with our clients um, to, to maybe change the, the way they're, they're, they're framing their thoughts because it's counterproductive to them from, from you know, our, our firm's perspective. Yes, and it's definitely anxiety provoking and depressive from a psychological uh, perspective. It's, it's, it's often that someone going through such a trauma and such a difficult time like divorce, um, they indulge catastrophic thinking. So they have these what if thoughts. And rather than playing the movie forward successfully, people with anxiety and depression, what if the thought in doom and gloom so they imagine a catastrophic ending, endings of loss, less, or never. And of course, that will create lots of fear and lots of regret and depression. So what if thinking is a common pattern of thought? Catastrophic thinking is a common pattern of thought. And even scary obsessive thoughts where they find themselves ruminating over the same thought again and again and again and playing it out and really kind of what we call suffering in advance. Um, so one of the things that I do as a psychotherapist in cognitive behavioral work is I teach the client how to identify the scary thought. We know how they're feeling. They're feeling fearful. They're feeling panic. They're feeling sad, they're feeling worried, but there's a thought that's creating those feelings. So I teach them how to identify the thought and then to replace it with what I call the three R's. What's rational, what's reasonable, and what's re realistic. And those cognitions or thoughts create a totally different set of emotions like freedom or calm or peace or empowerment, or courage. And those are the emotions that we all want to be driven by. So the identification of the scary thought and the replacement of that thought with the three R's is very, very important and, in fact, necessary to overcoming anxiety and depression. That sounds like a, a great tip there. And, I mean, this might be the part just when... We do these recordings. I try to have my team listen to the certain parts of them, and I think that's that's one of the parts that um, just us as a, as a law firm would benefit most from being able to do to our clients. And I think um, you know people going through this this type of situation um, would as as well. I, I think what you're talking about is, is fascinating. I've, um, I I saw a presentation once by a, um, a therapist in uh, Missouri named Jason Selk, and he was always try to uh, boil things down to, you know, one, what's, you know, when you get that negative self-talk, what's, what's one, one thing you can do now to make the situation better. And I think you're, you're maybe saying um, kind of a, a similar philosophy and maybe a way that's just a little more practical for most people to understand. And I think that's just amazing advice. Yes, it's, it's not only necessary, but it's quite powerful to silence the negative, scary thought. If we don't, it will continue to swim around in their head, and it becomes a slow brew. And that slow brew can culminate even in panic attacks. So it's a very powerful tool. It's a very necessary tool to identify the thoughts. We don't want to just thought stop. And we don't want to sweep those thoughts under the rug or distract ourselves because we can busy ourselves until we fall asleep at night. And, but those thoughts are still swimming around in our heads. And sometimes that's what we can attribute to those middle of the night panic attacks or waking up with heart palpitations or feeling that hit in our belly. It's super important to look at those scary thoughts head on 
identify them, and then what I call slay them with at least five to seven full positive statements of what's rational, reasonable, and realistic. Well, the three R's, I think if people take away anything, it should should be that. Um, yeah. Now, Mona, your, um, your practice, uh, I know all about it, um, and um, you know, know some of your, your clinicians that work with you um, personally, myself, but just for the people that are listening to this and they're saying, hey, I mean, Mona might have a point here with some of this, maybe she can help me or, or her um, practice can. Maybe just speak for a minute about um, you know, what your practice does, the types of um, you know, matters that you all are, are the best at um, helping people with and just maybe the geographic reach so people understand um, what y'all do, how to get in touch with you if it might be um, potentially a good fit. Thank you. I'm so proud of my team. We each have a variety of specialties that makes us quite unique and uh, complementary to one another um, from dealing with addictions and personality challenges to marriage and family. Um, we also work with eating disorders and uh, various other anxiety disorders, depressive disorders. And so we really offer a variety of types of help. And we have lots of tools in the toolbox so that we meet the client where they're at and at their point of need. And so I think the other thing that sets us apart is how much we care. We actually care very much. We come to love our clients and we work very hard to help them to be set free, to live their best lives and to move toward the goals that collaboratively um, we've determined um, is best for them, their goals. So it's our, it's our joy to serve the community in the way that we do. And we are centrally located in Palm Beach County. We are in downtown West Palm Beach. And so we have clients coming from Boca and all the way uh, down to Stewart. So um, we feel, or up to Stewart, I should say. So we feel very, very proud of our team and, and the work that we're doing in Palm Beach County. Right, and um, can, do, do any of your clinicians, do they um, do the telehealth or the, um, I guess, um, you know, FaceTime type therapy? I know it's more complicated than that, but the stuff so that people don't have to travel to the office? Yes, we do see people via telehealth. So for those that are more comfortable or even uh, it's just maybe more convenient for them, we mm -hmm. do see people remotely via telehealth. And it does not lose any amount of efficacy in using telehealth. So that is something that uh, we do offer at our practice. And of course, uh, in-person sessions as well, which is really highly beneficial for couples, the in-person work. So um, Mona, for um, the people who are watching this on video, they'll have your information and practice website up on the screen, but maybe just one more time before we go, if you could just tell um, the listeners the name of your practice, the website, and the, the phone number to use um, to, to reach out. I think um, probably be a few people that really like that information. Thank you. We're Restoring Hope of the Palm Beaches, and our website is restoringhopeofthepalmbeaches.com. Our phone number is 561-309-3188. And we are centrally located in West Palm Beach. So we have happy clients all the way from Stewart to Boca. And again, the phone number is 561-309-3188. Well, um, thank you so much, Mona. Um, again, my name's uh, Christopher Bruce, and I've had the pleasure of being here with uh, Mona Nasser of Restoring Hope of the Palm Beaches. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy practice to uh, talk with me on something that's so important. I really appreciate that. Thank you.